Namaste. I just finished going through the Brahma Sutras, the Vedanta Sutras, as some people call them. And uh, this is the second time I've gone through them. Gurdjieff always said you should read the first time for just the content. You know, it's just skim it. Then the second time you go through to annotate your reading with marginalia, that means notes and highlights, to single out the most important things. Then finally, on the third reading, you should really try to understand it, to duplicate it, to understand the meaning so well that you can actually practice it. So with Vedanta Sutra, that's a pretty high bar. <laughs> but what I've done is highlight the various important parts with different colors to color code. Yellow is the sutras. Purple are the quotes from the Upanishads and other scriptures. Green is the important things in the commentary. Red is the opponent arguing and so on. So if you already downloaded Liquid Text, which I highly recommend, you can download the complete annotated version of Brahma Sutras, translated by Swami Gambhirananda. And uh, you can then enjoy it, use the table of contents to zoom in on the content you're interested in, search, I mean, you, know, you can do all kinds of stuff with liquid text. <laughs> That's how I research all my videos. So the most interesting thing I found in Brahma Sutra, besides the extensive arguments against materialism based on the Upanishads, was the last section, the last part of chapter three and the entire chapter four, because they deal with the moment of death, the time of death, and what happens to the living entity, what happens to the soul, the individual. So to boil it down to a simple, uh, clear understanding, there are four types of destinations after death. If a person has been completely sinful, in other words, they didn't do anything good in their whole life, they don't go anywhere. After death, they're immediately reborn in the plant and insect species worms and, you know, nasty things like that. And they have to be reborn many, many, many times in these species, uh, you know, which is a cutthroat, competitive struggle for survival in uh, a really nasty conditions, right? So that's what happens to the people who do bad things, really bad things. Now, the people who are mixed, who have done some good things and some bad things, they go to the moon. And this is, you know, the typical uh, near-death experience with the tunnel of light and the whole thing, you know, and the, the light and the distance and all that. It's the moon. So they go to the moon, but not in a gross form, in a subtle form. That's why, you know, spacecraft and like that can't detect anything. <laughs> Silly scientists. Anyway, people go in that form and there they experience the results of their pious activities, their good activities, activities according to the scriptures. But then they have to go to other realms for suffering the results of their impious activities, the activities that are forbidden in the scriptures. 
Uh, so it's mixed. And then after that, they come back again to the planet Earth to be born either as a human or an animal, depending on their karma. Then they have to work their way up back to the human species. Being in the human species is like being in a crowded bus terminal or airport. There are people hurrying here and there and everywhere on their way to some destination. But what is that destination? When a person attains realization of the secondary Brahman, Saguna Brahman, Brahman with form and qualities, he goes to the sun planet after death. Now, the sun path leads to the higher heaven. The moon path only goes to the lower heaven with all the demigods like Indra, Chandra, Varuna, and so on. But the path of the sun goes beyond to the higher heaven. That is the pure lands, as the Buddhists call it, or pure creation, Lakshmi Tantra calls it, which exists undisturbed for the entire duration of the cosmic creation, whereas the lower heaven is dissolved at the end of every Mahakalpa. I don't know, it says several hundreds of millions of years or so, or billions of years. It's a long time by our standards, but compared to the total length of the creation, it's like days and nights. In fact, they are days and nights of Lord Brahma. So every time Lord Brahma's day ends, all the lower planets, including the lower heavenly planets, merge into dissolution. They merge into the causal ocean. And then when Brahma wakes up in his next morning, they're all restored. He creates them all over again. This is the cosmic cycle. But the higher heaven is beyond all of that. So one can live there with Shakti and Shiva and all of Shiva's associates and all of Shakti's servants, both human and animal, uh, because she's Mother Nature, you know. So all the species serve her, worship her, except the bad human beings. <laughs> but anyway, by worshiping Shakti, one can reach the higher heaven. But by worshiping Brahman, when you leave the body, well, first of all, within the life itself, you become Jivan Mukta by realizing Brahman. Shankaracharya says, you don't even need dharana, concentration. You don't even need dhyana, meditation. Why? Because you're in constant samadhi. This is Jivan Mukta. It's constantly aware, aham brahmasmi, I am Brahman. No matter what is happening externally, it doesn't matter. So that person, at the time of death, directly merges with Brahman. He doesn't go anywhere. Because to such a person, there is nowhere to go. Everywhere is here. Everything is I. So wherever he is, whatever he is, he simply immediately merges with Brahman and there is no movement at all. There's no process. There's no transformation. There's none of that. One simply ceases to exist. This is the Nibbana, the Nirvana, discussed by the Buddha so extensively. But the Buddhists now don't get it. And they busy themselves with making merit 
which means ceremonial sacrifices, worship and offering and like that. And maybe they do a little show meditation, but they don't seriously meditate. When I say seriously meditate, I mean like 8, 10, 12 hours a day or even more. I've done several retreats like that, extensive retreats lasting three to six months. And it was the most significant experience of my spiritual life because that's when I attained the big realizations. <laughs> Duh. People think, that just by, you know, taking little doses of Advaita or little doses, you know, 15 minutes a day of meditation or something like they can get somewhere. No, you're not going to get anywhere like that. It's just like if you're traveling by walking, which if you haven't tried it, <laughs> it's something really cool. You uh, put a pack on your back, which contains your necessities, and you walk. You just walk places. It's very nice. Anyway, if you do that, how far can you get in 15 minutes? Not even a mile, unless you run, you know. Maybe a kilometer. You could maybe hike a kilometer in 15 minutes. But, you know... That's still your backyard. To really go any place by walking, you have to walk for hours. And the same is true of meditation. Might sound like a cliche, but it's really true. Huh? In life, you get what you pay for. The time and energy that you invest comes back to you in terms of some result. And the idea is that meditation is a kind of a stepwise, kind of a quantum thing. It has these different levels separated by transitions. So these transitions are similar to the transitions between day and night at sunset and night and day at dawn. These are called sandhya. And similarly, there are sandhyas or transformations, junctions, between the different meditative states. And you can never be sure exactly when they're going to occur, because it's all spontaneous and based on the state of concentration and so forth. So you just have to hang in there until something happens. That's really the only way to do it. If you're really serious about meditation, spiritual life, enlightenment, and so on like that, you won't join any clubs, you know? You'll go off by yourself. This was the Buddha's advice to those students who had actually mastered the teaching, the philosophy. He'd say, okay, now go off by yourself and do the practices. Do what has to be done. What is that? to erase the individuality, to uncreate the individual ego. Then one easily merges with Brahman, effortlessly, in fact. It's simply a matter of already being a fact that you are Brahman. So if you just relax and let go of everything, it happens automatically. Well, it's already the case. It's just you have to see it. You have to recognize it, acknowledge it, own it, and live it. That's the Jivan Mukta. Om Tatsa. Om Shakti Om. Om Namah Shivaya. <laughs>